to cardiovascular unit, circulatory unit. Um, today is kind of wrapping up with the heart. Tomorrow we will move on to the vessels. So wrapping up with the heart and different components of the heart. Tomorrow, looking at arteries, veins, vessels, that kind of thing. So we're moving at a really good pace, which is what I want to keep at, kind of a steady pace. Did we have any chance really to look at that gizmo? A little bit? Okay. So um, the next thing I do want to do is the kind of the lab to test heart rates, blood pressures, those kinds of things. So that is like the next intention of doing a lab of that. Maybe. So wrapping up with the heart, looking at some of the components of it again, and right versus left, the right, and just kind of an overview. I know we've seen this picture before. Um, right side of the heart is referring to patient's right versus patient's left. Right side is going to receive oxygen poor blood. Left side is going to receive the oxygenated blood. Remembering, and this is kind of just to refresh our memory because uh, it has been a three day weekend and finally a three day weekend. I guess you guys had a three day weekend last week. I didn't. But the pulmonary circuit versus the systemic circuit and how it makes that figure eight pattern. So you don't have a whole lot to write down here. Just make sure you understand the functions of the heart and again, the functions of the valves and why the valves are important. So really not a lot to write down here. So this is mostly a review of what we talked about before. All right, now if we were taking an X-ray, this is what it would look like. This is obviously the lungs, the rib cage, and here's our heart. And we were talking a little bit before about why you feel the heart beat mostly on the left side. And this is why, because the heart does kind of project down toward the left and it's kind of angled that way. And so you can see most of the heart here on the left angled toward that direction. And that's also why there are less lobes on this side side of the lungs and there are more lobes on the right side of the lungs. Another comparison, this is a normal female and this is a male and the angle of the heart and most of it does sit in the um, left side of the chest cavity and just another view of the lungs in the back and the chest or the heart kind of more toward the front protected by the sternum of the body. The pericardium, we didn't really talk too much about that because again, that's more of an anatomy thing, but the pericardium is the sac that covers the heart. So this is an important feature that, think of it as kind of, a, well, sac really is the best way to describe it. It is a tissuey covering that coats the heart itself it holds the, it's like a membrane that has fat over it. And that's what you're seeing here is a lot of fat. It's kind of a clear tissue, clear membrane. This one has a lot of the pericardium removed. So you can see the heart itself a lot better. When we do the dissection, which again, that'll probably be one of the last things that we do in here. You won't be able to see much of the heart until you cut the pericardium away. Although we will do, the sheep heart before too long. I don't remember, I don't remember if the heart we have has the pericardium on it or not. I think the pericardium has been removed. So you won't be able to see the pericardium on the heart that we have. I think our heart looks more like this and less like this. But in the dissection of the cat, it'll look like this. Uh -huh. Yeah, what did you say? What? Do you know that? Nope. We're dissecting the cat. What, what do you do with that? That's like an anatomy. If we do cat anatomy, we can see. So, so, so we'll be doing those? Yeah. Do okay. But, and here we focus more on the function. In anatomy, we'll focus more on the structures. structures. In anatomy, we probably won't have a dissection test in this class, but in anatomy, we will. We okay. had part of the 
final with the dissection test, like you had to go through and identify the structure. Like kind of, with a pig? Yeah, only more intense. It was more intense in anatomy because you're expected by the end of the thing because that's what you focus on all year in anatomy with the structure. So. so. classroom, I really liked this picture because it shows how the valves are functioning. Uh, we kind of talked a little bit about it, but it was hard for me to describe and I liked this picture especially. It shows how the valves shut. When the blood is pushing up against it, it closes the valve pretty well. So these two pieces push closed and it prevents it from opening. It's easy for the blood to go back down this way, but the blood, when it pushes up against it, it actually holds it together and prevents the blood from going backwards. So when it is going down one way, that's easy. And this would be a, would this be a semilunar or would this be an atrial ventricular valve? Which do you think? Uh, yeah, so this is an atrial ventricular valve. We can tell because it has the chordae tendineae attached to it. This one would be a what? Yeah, this would be a semilunar because it doesn't have the chordae tendineae. The chordae tendineae are only found on the atrial ventricular valve. Also, you can see a picture here, which kind of gives it away as well. So the chordae tendineae are the giveaway, really. Um, they are only found on the atrial ventricular valves. And the semilunar are semilunar because they're curved like lunar ones. Um, but they both work the same way pretty much. The blood can only flow one direction, and then when the valves snap shut, which give that lub dub lub dub sound, they are going to prevent backflow. And if the blood were to try and go backwards, it actually presses the valve closed. This is also showing how the valves function. This is that afterload we talked about. So the blood is filling up and sitting on the valve, especially here in the semilunar area. So that's kind of the point of the valve, again, is to sit on these areas so that the, the blood doesn't go back down into the heart and making sure it goes in one direction. But also that means that if it's sitting there and not going backwards, it's gonna have to push extra hard because now not only is the blood going through the valve, it's lifting up all the weight of that blood that's sitting on that valve. So that we talked about preload and afterload, and this is that afterload, it's having to press up against that to open that valve. So the heart has to contract extra hard in order to move all that weight of that blood that is sitting on top of that valve in order to open that valve up. So it's moving a lot of extra weight from the blood that's sitting on top of that. This is what the heart looks like if we're looking kind of down on top of it. A lot, we, it's kind of messy, actually. You'll see that when we dissect the sheep heart. It's really kind of messy when you look at it because there's so much going on, especially at the back of the heart. Sometimes it's even hard to tell which is the front and which is the back and which vessel is going where. So this is actually kind of what I would call a clean looking heart in a clean orientation of the heart because you've got a lot of those messy vessels that have been removed. So it's almost better to look at it like this because a lot of the messiness has been taken away. So it's easier to see. You've got the ventricles that have, or sorry, atrium that are a little more visible. And then you've got your semilunar valves, which are exposed here so that you can see the vessels that are protruding from the heart. Um, so a lot cleaner view and not nearly as messy as it could be. Now, this is, I, I found this slide and I thought it was an interesting way to describe it. This is starting at the most simple and then going to more complex and detailed. If you wanted to describe the pattern of flow in one sentence, this is about as simple as you could get. Body to right heart to lungs to left heart to body. I mean, you really can't get much more simple than that line. 
It goes from the body to the right heart, to the lungs, to the left heart, to the body. That is about as simple as you can describe the blood flow. Now, if you wanted to go a little more advanced, you could use this paragraph. It goes from the body to the right vena cava, and then to the coronary sinus, and then to the right atrium, to the right ventricle, to the lung by the pulmonary arteries, to the, the left atrium by the pulmonary veins, to the left ventricle, and to the body by the aorta. So, and then from the aorta, it's gonna go to the body, then by the vena cavas, and so on. So it like repeats. So this was a little more detailed. Then, if you wanted to go super detailed, you go to the next paragraph. So I thought this was an interesting slide because it's like you could kind of pick which one. I didn't think for our purposes, because we're a physiology class and not an anatomy class, that we needed to go to the third paragraph. Because the third paragraph is saying the same thing, only in a lot of detail. So I thought the first two was sufficient for us because we didn't need to know all of the terms. Because <laughs> after a while, you just get confused. themselves aren't terribly complicated. There's some differences and similarities between them. Um, the exchange of capillary level, as long as you remember osmosis and diffusion. You guys remember osmosis and diffusion? I do a lot with that. We've kind of been going back to it. High concentrations, low concentrations, that kind of thing. As long as you remember that, there's a reason I pounded that into your head earlier. And it should be fine. Because also we'll talk about that with respiratory, and we'll talk about that with digestive as well. And excretory. Alright. Moving of the blood flow pulmonary arteries, aortic arch, this is called the aortic arch, and we have the descending aorta that comes down, this descending aorta. This is inferior vena cava, superior vena cava. We didn't learn those. This is a Google Classroom, just a flow of how things move through the body. Blue representing deoxygenated blood, rep representing oxygenated. <laughs> Looking into the heart, and this is what we're going to see when we dissect the heart. I say dissect, but really we're just kind of cutting it in half. And we're going to cut from the apex, which is the point part of the heart, upwards, and cutting it in half. That way we'll be able to see the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves, the chordae tendinae the left side, and we know this is the left because it is thicker, and the right side because it is thinner, and the different valves, hopefully, and then, again, it gets really messy up here. So we'll see what we can see, but it'll probably be kind of messy. And this is showing one of the valves and the chordae tendinae. <laughs> So the heart sounds, we've already mentioned this, but this is getting a little more in depth. So um, the heart sounds are called S1 and S2. S1 is the closing of the AV valve, 
which is the mitral and the tricuspid. Mitral is also called the bicuspid. We already mentioned that as well. Creates the lub sound. S2 is the closing of the semilunar or um, the aortic and the pulmonary semilunar valves. And this is the end of ventricular systole, and that creates the dub sound. Now you might hear murmurs, and this is the sound of the flow. Murmurs can be normal or they can be abnormal. If you hear an abnormal murmur, this is typically because the valves are not closing all the way and you're getting basically it's backwash of blood. So whenever our doctors are looking at this, they're listening for your breathing, but they're also listening for your heartbeats too. And when they're listening for your heartbeats, they're listening to that backwash of blood. It is they can hear any backwash of blood. Siblings or the animals. Does that come from the four packs? Pack. 
Or is that four the six? Can you, everyone's like running in there trying to get them. <laughs> I take two. <laughs> All right. Um, embryological development of the heart. The heart starts beating by day 22. The, that's about four weeks into pregnancy. So with heartbeats, you can usually detect it on an ultrasound by about five weeks. Now, it's really weird when a person becomes pregnant, they typically don't even schedule a visit until about 12 weeks. Um, the earliest I heard a baby's heartbeat with a home, like handheld one that I had at home was eight weeks. Uh, with my other kid, like I didn't have a home one for my first two pregnancies, but then I did have a home Doppler for the second two pregnancies. And I heard a heartbeat at eight weeks with one and 10 weeks with the other. And then, so those were the earliest, but the heart starts beating at four weeks. You can usually hear a heartbeat by a doctor's Doppler by about five weeks. Ultrasound, you can usually see it by about four to five weeks that they can go to the doctor's office and see it on ultrasound. This shows how the heart is formed. The fusion of two vessels, they join together and they then they kind of fold down like that. So this would be the atriums, this would be the ventricle, and then they kind of fold and make this pattern where the atriums are smaller and the ventricle is bigger. The baby looks, I don't know, alien-like. And we've already talked about neural tube formation. Neural tube is one of the first things, so the heart is going to form after the neural tube because remember the brain stem is going to initiate the heartbeat. And so you have to have the brain stem in place first before it can control the heartbeat. And the heart therefore will develop after the brain stem. So the corpus. The difficult part. So what happens if like, cause I don't know if someone that has like half a heart, mm -hmm. what happens with that? Probably this fusion doesn't work correctly. So like one of them is just that they just won't work completely? Yeah, right. they don't fuse completely here. Yeah, if they've only got half a heart, then they, like this fusion probably didn't happen. Would be my guess. Would it, like, would the actual, like, would their blood be, or like their body be like, affected by that, or would that be? Most likely, I would guess that they would just have flow going one direction. If, I mean, it depends on what kind of half a heart they have. Do they have like an atrium? Do they have like a ventricle? Do they have, well, they probably have to have one of these. I think that they, that they gave him something, or they, he has something that like acts as a like part of it to like get pumped through that. They have to. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, I, they, it'd be missing a whole circuit. It'd be missing the pulmonary circuit. So they'd have to have some kind yeah. of surgery to get there. Yeah. So then you would have the two divisions later on that split it and send one to the lungs and one to the heart so that will develop later on now when the child is in the uterus it doesn't need the lungs there's no breathing that is going on they will practice breathing but there's no oxygen because they get all the nutrients they need from the placenta and the mother's reproductive or the mother's um, bloodstream but that's a whole other thing which we'll go over in the reproductive system is that the placenta doesn't actually touch the mother's bloodstream. There's no mixing of the two. The mother's blood does not mix with the baby's blood. They're separate. They get close, but there's actual there's no actual mixing of the two bloodstreams. So they get all the nutrients from, that they need from the mother. That means that they're not actually breathing. They'll kind of practice breathing, but they have something called the foraminal valve. The foraminal valve is a hole that is in the atriums of the heart that bypass the pulmonary system or the pulmonary circuit. So the blood that would normally go be pumped to the lungs doesn't get pumped to the lungs because they don't need to oxygenate the blood at the lungs. So they will pump some blood to the lungs, but most of it gets shunted from the 
right atrium to the left atrium and bypasses the lungs completely because it doesn't need to go to the lungs. Now this foramen valve will close soon after birth. But sometimes you hear of a baby being born with a hole in his heart and the foramen valve is one of those holes. It could be a different hole as well, but the foramen valve is oftentimes the hole that is left open when the baby is born with a hole in his heart. There's also the fossa ovalis, which is left over from the fetal hole in the septum from the foramen valve. You see this as kind of like a little almost scar that is within where the foramen valve used to be. Um, there's also something called the ductus arteriosus, which shunts blood to the aorta in the right ventricle. This is another thing that fetuses have. It's like a little shunt, and we'll look at a picture of this in a moment, that kind of moves the blood in the aorta to the right ventricle, again, as a way to bypass the lungs. It becomes a ligament later on after birth. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of neat that the heart has so many special adaptations for a fetus because their heart doesn't need lungs yet. It doesn't need oxygen from these lungs yet. So they're not breathing. But also, one of the reasons why when a baby is born premature that they have to worry so much about a baby being able to breathe. We haven't talked about surfactant yet. Um, we'll talk about that more when we get to the respiratory unit, but surfactant is a material that is in the lungs that keeps the lungs from sticking together. And so surfactant isn't developed until later on in the baby's life, closer to delivery. And so if the baby is born really premature, then they usually don't have surfactant, and that's one of the reasons why breathing is so difficult for babies, because their lungs, like the little sacs, that are called alveoli, they stick together. So this is what the heart of a baby looks like. Here's our foramen valve. It is, go and the purple means that the blood is mixed oxygen and deoxygenated, that's why it's purple. This is the newborn heart. You've got your deoxygenated and oxygenated blood and it's separate, but in a fetus, you've got your foramen valve that shunts the blood across because, and it causes it to mix oxygen and deoxygenated blood. You also have your ductus arteriosus right here, and you have your blood being shunted into the aorta, and a little joining right here as well. And all of this, again, is to bypass the lungs because you don't need the lungs. This would normally go to the lungs, but you don't need it to go to the lungs because, again, it's not necessary. So you have a bypass from the lungs here, and you have another bypass from the lungs right here. So going straight to the aorta, going straight to the other <laughs> Pretty neat. But if they don't close right, then you got issues. Then you gotta come in and have surgery to close that, or you have to come in and have surgery to close that. Um, so that means that a lot of babies are born with congenital abnormalities of the heart, because if those don't close properly, then the baby's gonna have issues, that they're not gonna be able to breathe correctly. Well, they'll be able to breathe, but they won't be able to get the oxygen that they need because their heart didn't close the correct places like they're supposed to. So being able to get that oxygen is really important. Um, one of every 150 newborns have some congenital heart defect, most due to the foramen valve or ductus arteriosus not closing properly. So there's a lot of issues that could happen because, yes, the fetus heart has made these cool adaptations, but did the fetus heart close the proper places after the baby was born. It's possible that it didn't. One in 150 newborns didn't close it right. And so the baby has to have surgery. I mean, that's not a very high statistic. That's a pretty low statistic.
was it for like 12 hours. Are you guys have dangerous fingers? We have a sleep trip. Oh, So this is showing different types of congenital heart defects and where they could be. So this is the ductus arteriosus, this is the foramenal valve. Um, this is just a malformation, and this one could also be another type of malformation. Um, you should be familiar with congenital heart defects. You don't need to know all of them. I would just remember the foramenal valve and the ductus arteriosus, and you should be fine with just knowing those two. But I did put this one in Google Classroom. Um, these are just some of the more common ones that you could see. So you can see there's a lot of different kinds. This one is a valve issue. This one has a lot going on. This one's got the valve, but there's also a place here in the septum. This one has got something with the valves as well, and it looks like a restriction in the septum. This one's got a restriction up here by the pulmonary area, but also around the aorta. And this is showing how the blood can flow incorrectly through various places when you have some congenital conditions. Also in Google Classroom. Others showing the same thing. This one's got a constriction down here. This one, the um, septums didn't form correctly. And the same thing. This one's got a bad valve. So you don't need to know all the congenital conditions. I would just be familiar with the um, foramenal valve and the ductus arteriosus. So the heart needs to be supplied with a series of vessels that are on the outside. These are called the coronary arteries. We're not going to learn the coronary arteries because that is an anatomy thing, but you need to know that the coronary arteries and the coronary veins are very important. The blood that is inside the heart, it can't give oxygen to the heart itself, but the heart muscles still need oxygen. They, in fact, if they don't get oxygen, the heart dies. But just because the heart pumps blood doesn't mean that, that the blood inside is giving oxygen to the heart. What's giving oxygen to the heart are the veins and the arteries and the, the stuff on the outside of the heart. And that's what all those vessels on the outside are doing. They're very, very important. They're the ones that are supplying the heart muscles in the heart cells with oxygen and taking away the carbon dioxide. So there's a series of vessels on the outside, and that's what this picture on the bottom is showing, that is doing the vital job of giving the nutrients to the heart muscles itself. They all have names, and again, we're not gonna learn that, take anatomy, you'll learn it then. But we will be able to see the major ones on the chief part when we dissect that. A lot of these go down like the center of the two um, ventricles are underneath the atriums and they wrap around the back of the heart. There's a big sinus here, the coronary sinus is a big one. And again, they, there's um, veins and arteries both. Now, it, have you guys ever heard of somebody who's had bypass surgery? I've heard Yeah, and usually it revol involves like open heart surgery. They try to do the front and they have to open up the chest. Yeah. That's because one of these has become blocked and the heart is no longer getting oxygen because one of these has become blocked. So what they do is they usually take a vein out of the leg and they will come in and they will go like build a little bridge over the blockage. And that's why they bypass it. Yeah, so they've done it twice yeah. to two different places. Um, or like a triple one, they've done it three times. But that's what it means, is they have taken a vein usually out of the leg, and they will come in and it, they will find the blockages, and they will go over the blockages and bypass it, and sew a little place on over wherever the blockage is. Um, whether it's over here, they'll sew a little vein vessel on over the blockage. And that's why it's called bypass surgery. They'll bypass the bad part. And my grandfather had four, like a quadruple bypass. And so they will bypass it to make sure that the heart is getting the... How do they replace the veins in the leg? The veins in the leg are really long, so they would just kind of pull it straight. And they so they'd have to stretch it? Mm -hmm. How do they form veins together? 
how do they figure that out? But I mean, they're like, they're so long that they uh, do a lesson of stretch. And they don't need no, much. No, no, like, how do they connect them back together? And how do they? Just sell it. Really? Mm -hmm. You'll see when we do the dissection that they're very stretchy. Yeah, they're very stretchy. What are we doing? Especially are stretchy. When will we do the dissection? Mm -hmm. We'll do the heart one soon, but we'll do the cat one at the end of the year. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Hey, look, we finished. Look at us. How do we do a sheet brain if you're picking up on I didn't find a sheet brain. Yeah. But we definitely have the heart one. I saw the heart one back there. Yeah. I didn't, I couldn't find a sheet. I looked everywhere for the sheet. So All right, so we're still working on that circulatory gizmo for right now. Um, that's what we're, and that will be due this Friday. So, are you, anybody in here taking the ACT? Uh, it's like Thursday, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm planning on having Thursday be a work day because I knew several people would be gone. So that will be our work day this week, and you can plan on those for a couple times. Okay? Questions? Um, work on the circulatory gizmo for now.